So thanks, Ed, and thanks to everyone for, for showing up on such a beautiful day. <laughs> Uh, I've just flown in from Brazil, so if, if, uh, if, if, if I can't really put one word after the other, blame the jet lag. Um, so it's great to be here, it's great to be back at ODI. Uh, as Ed said, I've, uh, I spent a lot of time here myself, so it's always great to be back, especially in these fancy new um, premises. Um, yeah, as uh, this is actually the first physical copy that I hold in my hands, I've only... Uh, ever seen just the PDF versions of the different chapters and a JPEG of the, of the cover. So it, it's great that it's finally out. It's been about three years in the making, so um, big sigh of relief when, when everything got sent off and big sigh of relief, relief now that we actually get um, physical copies sent out and distributed and, and, and available for purchase, of course. So let me tell you a little bit about how this project came about if it works, yes, yeah. the origins of the research project. So the, the, the whole idea uh, behind the book and behind the research that, that went into the book comes from IBP's efforts at promoting budget transparency worldwide. And one of the key uh, pieces of, of research and of advocacy that we do is the Open Budget Survey and the Open Budget Index, which you may have heard of and, and seen before. It started in, uh, in, two, in 2006 was the first time that, that we actually carried out and published the survey. Uh, it covered a more limited number of countries. Then over the years, we published it every two years. Uh, in 2012, last year was the last round. It covered 100 countries. Uh, it, we set it up as, um, as a way to first assess levels of budget transparency across the world and to uh, use it as an advocacy tool to convince governments that they should become more transparent. And it's based on uh, assessing whether governments publish uh, eight key budget documents that all governments are meant to produce and make publicly available throughout the budget cycle, uh, and how comprehensive those documents are. So it's, it's a reasonably narrow definition of, of transparency, um, and, and, and one that we've been trying to sort of complement with some other elements that look at, for example, uh, opportunities for citizen engagement and participation in the budget process, uh, the role of oversight actors like parliaments and, uh, and supreme audit institutions, and, and so on and so forth. But basically, as we started doing this research, uh, and, and, and this project actually used as, as its main inputs uh, results from the 2008 and, and 2010 survey, we found out that there were huge disparities in, in levels of budget transparency across the world. So even within the same continent, if you take Africa, you've got a lot of countries scoring pretty much zero, but you've got you know, what in, in 2010 was the best performing country in the world, uh, South Africa. And you've got a, a bunch of countries in the middle, like Uganda and Ghana and Namibia and Botswana, who actually do reasonably well according to the standards that, um, that we set, which is basically which is based on, on international good practice standards, such as the ones put forward by the IMF and the OECD. So then the question comes up, why is it that some countries are so much more transparent than others? And so we started looking into it, and in the, in the different OBI reports, what you find is some very simple bivariate correlations that we used to find uh, in a pretty consistent manner. So what you see in that, um, scatterplot graph uh, at the top is the correlation between budget transparency and income. Richer countries are more transparent. Uh, that's, that's, you know, it's quite expectable, it's nothing new, but it was one of the things that we started looking at. The chart at the bottom shows differences in uh, the strength of democratic institutions, showing that more democratic countries are on average more transparent, have more open budgets. Again, uh, nothing necessarily new on that, but there were a few more that that we also found. For example, countries in the Middle East and North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa are less transparent. Countries that are dependent on foreign aid and on uh, natural resource revenues also are less transparent. So we, we had these, this, you know, this, this series of bivariate correlations, but not much more than that. Uh, and we also went out and looked at other research in the field, and it was actually very, very thin. I think that when we started, back when we started, there were literally a handful of academic papers trying to um, uh, explain differences in fiscal transparency levels and trying to assess whether fiscal transparency in itself or budget transparency in itself was a good thing if it had good consequences or, 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 or positive impacts. 
uh, and, and this in a context, like Ed said, where there's increasing international interest and increasing international uh, attention to the issue of transparency more generally, uh, fiscal transparency more specifically, not just because of the global financial crisis, but more generally because of uh, increasing attention to institutions and good governance and, and so on and so forth. So in the middle of all of this, we said we need to do something. We need to, if there's no research out there, then we need to basically start our own research so that we can better understand what's going on behind these numbers. <laughs> and we started off with three key research questions. The first one is, is a very simple one that looks at how and why do improvements in fiscal transparency and participation come about? What are some of the key factors that can explain uh, change in these variables over time? And when these changes happen, uh, how are they sustained over time? So uh, again, what are some of the country characteristics that seem to be correlated and seem to explain higher levels of fiscal transparency and participation in fiscal matters? The second one is a slightly more complex one and looks at the linkages between fiscal transparency and participation on one side and uh, different types of outcomes on the other. And, and more specifically, government responsiveness and improved accountability. So under what conditions and through what type of mechanisms can we see or can we um, infer that more transparency and participation actually lead to a, a bunch of the things that we're really interested in? I mean, we do believe that Transparency in and of itself uh, is, is, uh, is a worthy goal, but obviously we're mostly interested in transparency because it brings about other positive things like better fiscal management, reduce, uh, reductions in corruption levels, uh, possibly shifts in budget policies towards more um, uh, pro-poor outcomes or uh, you know, um, social sector spending, for example, or other similar goals, and improvement in the quality and the delivery of, of public <coughs> services. So that was the second question. But more generally, we were interested in the complex interrelationships uh, between and among transparency, participation, and accountability in fiscal matters. Uh, people tend to assume that transparency automatically and, and inevitably leads to accountability. Uh, by now, we pretty much all know that that's not always the case. And actually, it's probably more often not the case than um, um, in more cases, that, it, that link doesn't work rather than, rather than it does. So then we need to really ask ourselves, when and how can this link be built, and when and how does it work, and, and what can uh, different actors do to make that link work, uh, work better? So we started off with these, uh, with these questions, and we tried to gather the um, best people working in the field uh, 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 including some of the gentlemen sitting here at the table. So we decided we basically split the work in two, in two legs. The first leg was, was more quantitative. Uh, we, we wanted to test using the OBI as a quantitative variable. So we hired a bunch of people. At the time, I didn't work at IBP, so I, I was also one of the bunch of the people that were hired at the time uh, to carry out some statistical analysis using the OBI uh, as a key variable in, in, uh, in regressions. And there were three studies that we carried out looking at the causes, potential causes of, of, uh, of fiscal transparency or budget transparency. So Joachim and I worked on a paper that looked at the political determinants of, of fiscal transparency, looking at elections and uh, political competition. We had Michael Ross from UCLA working on uh, uh, resource abundance, uh, to what extent resource dependent countries uh, to what extent resource dependency has an impact on, on budget transparency levels. There was another paper that, uh, again, I worked on with, um, with a, a former colleague called uh, Diego Angemi, looking at aid dependency and how aid dependency affects uh, budget transparency. And then we had two studies looking at consequences of, of budget transparency. So the impact that budget transparency levels have on sovereign credit ratings and the impact that budget transparency levels can have or may have on human development indicators. And of course, that's, that's a slightly more difficult uh, link to um, unpack and demonstrate, but we, we thought it was uh, worthwhile giving it a try. So we had Sakiko Fukudapar and uh, some of our colleagues at the New School work on, on that paper. And in parallel to that, we, um, we commissioned a bunch of, of country case studies. So we set up basically uh, some sort of a process tracing methodology that sort of looked more historically 
at uh, country trajectories over time, and we selected a bunch of countries uh, with, an, with a number of criteria. So we basically high and low OBI scores, so we wanted to look at countries that were doing well and, and doing not so well on the Open Budget Index. We looked at countries in different regions, we looked at countries at different levels of, of development in terms of um, income levels, and we looked at countries with different uh, political systems. And in, in the end, the choice fell on those eight countries that you see listed, but we also had a few additional ones that are not included in the book, but that we also did case studies of, and those are Uganda, Kenya, and uh, China. Uh, they didn't make the final cut into the book, but they, they provided additional material that I will also draw on for this, uh, for this presentation. So what did we find? First of all, let, let me say a few things about the, um, the five quantitative and, and comparative um, statistical studies. Uh, the paper Joachim and I worked on showed that elections and political competition have a positive impact on budget transparency. And basically, the idea, we basically took two of the many possible ways in which uh, uh, the democratic game is, uh, is assessed and, uh, uh, and operationalized, and we basically tested two main hypotheses. The first one was, if a country goes from not having elections to having elections, what does that do to the OBI score? And we found that there was a significant and positive impact on fiscal transparency coming from, let's say, a, a non moving from a non-democratic system to a democratic system measured on the basis of holding regular elections. And the second one uh, looked at political competition. So the, 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 um, the, the number of parties that, that uh, had seats in parliaments. Uh, with the idea that if there is a chance that you know, the, the incumbent government is going to get kicked out at the next election, that that will stimulate the need for rules so that you know, once you're in opposition, you will be able to check what the government is actually doing. And so that more transparent systems will allow uh, all parties to do that and, uh, as they move in and out of power. And we again, we, sort of, um, we tested that hypothesis and we found that higher levels of political competition did have a significant and positive impact on levels of budget transparency. I'm going to go through these quite quickly, but you know, we'd, we, I'll be happy, and, uh, and I guess Joachim as well can help me <laughs> shed some light on these results if there are further questions. Uh, second paper on resource abundance, uh, two main findings. Uh, if you s often in the literature, there's this split between looking at hydrocarbons and looking at mineral resources. And indeed, we did find some differences. So if you, if you only look at dependency on uh, revenues from mineral, mineral resources, there was no clear impact on, uh, on levels of budget transparency. So you know, having lots of iron, gold, copper, or anything like that doesn't seem to affect positively or negatively your levels of budget transparency. But if you have a lot of oil, then things change. Oil income does negatively affect, and quite significantly and substantively, levels of budget transparency, but there's a twist. It only does so if the government is not democratic. If a government is democratic, is already democratic, take Norway of, as the obvious example, then oil dependency doesn't really do much to your levels of budget transparency. Which we thought, which we thought was quite an interesting finding because you know, if countries, say, say Ghana, for example, um, as they becoming resource dependent over time, may actually be able to um, escape the resource curse because of the already strong enough democratic institutions that it has. While other countries that don't have such, such democratic past, like Mozambique, for example, who will also soon become quite heavily dependent on, uh, on, on, on gas, not on, not on oil necessarily, but on gas resources, then things might uh, turn out a bit worse. Uh, third paper on, on aid dependency, there was a clear negative correlation between how aid dependent a country was and its levels of, uh, uh, of budget uh, op um, opacity or opaqueness, uh, what we found through the analysis was that it, it wasn't aid dependency per se that was the problem. It was more uh, donor behavior. So we checked a number of, say, donor behavior variables, and we found that um, the more donors as a collective in different countries engaged with country budget systems, um, the less the, the, the impact on budget transparency was negative. So in countries like Uganda, for example, where donors have, beha have behaved in a 
in a matter uh, in a manner that is more uh, conducive to building stronger budget systems, then things work out work out much better than in other countries where they use more fragmented uh, project aid or where they have not been supporting budget reforms uh, over a long period of time. So again, the finding there was that donor I external influences um, can work both ways, uh, depending on how donors behave. And finally, on the consequences, on the two papers looking at consequences, there were clear findings and very sort of um, uh, uh, consistent findings also from previous research that more transparent countries get better access to international financial markets to finance government debt. They, get, they have lower uh, sovereign credit ratings, they have lower spreads, so they're actually able to borrow more and, uh, and on better terms on the international financial markets, which you, would, you, would, you, would, you could guess <coughs> is probably a, a, a good incentive for governments to become uh, more transparent. And the final paper that looked at um, human development indicators, the, the, some evidence was found of, of a positive correlation between budget transparency and a few uh, human development indicators, but that those uh, correlations were quite, uh, the, sort of the, the significance and the strength of those correlations was actually quite weak once control variables were put in place. And, and that's hardly surprising given that uh, it is quite a difficult relationship and a quite a long causal chain that you're trying to test. So those were the, the quantitative papers that sort of gave us uh, a basis to work on. But then really the bulk of the evidence is in the, is in the case studies uh, that, we, that we commissioned. Uh, so what I'll present as the overall synthesis is actually bringing together all of the evidence from both the quantitative papers and the, and the country case studies. What did we find? We, we, we found that there are four main factors that seem to explain um, why certain countries improve their levels of budget transparency significantly over time. And those are, first of all, uh, political transitions. So countries moving from authoritarian to democratic regimes, countries moving from less, you know, uh, less political competition to more political competition, countries moving from one-party states to multi-party democracies, and so on and so forth. So if you take the examples of South Africa, Brazil, South Korea, to a lesser extent, maybe Mexico and Guatemala, those are all clear cases where uh, the, the ch changes from the apartheid regime to uh, after 1994, uh, changes after the 1988 uh, constitution in Brazil, changes, similar changes in South Korea as well. All of these transitions actually had a very strong impact on um, uh, rule, laws, rules, and procedures, and, and the practices that led to these countries scoring well on the open budget uh, <coughs> index. We also found that some of these uh, some of these components are not necessary enough uh, by themselves. So elections and multi-party politics are not necessarily enough to bring about not just fiscal transparency, but some of the follow-on results that look more at participation and uh, and accountability. So the nature of the political regime that emerges from these transitions is very important. The presence of uh, reformist politicians and technocrats in government is key to make, make sure that those reforms actually take hold and make a difference in practice. And the presence of a strong civil society uh, movement uh, uh, some of is another key factor in explaining not just increasing levels uh, of fiscal transparency, but also, uh, again, sort of downward impact on, on accountability, on reductions in corruption, on changes in budget policies. Uh, on, on cases basically of, of accountability actors being able to hold the government to account for what it does with, with public resources. South Africa is a, is a great example of that. Despite its very high scores on the Open Budget Index, the fact that it's basically uh, a one-party state, a, a state where the same party has been in power since the transition, um, makes it much more difficult for that fiscal transparency to actually be transformed into ac uh, active participation and strong accountability. So it's, it's a bit of a, um, it's an example of, uh, of stifled uh, transitions and stifled transparency, if you wish. Second factor, fiscal and economic crisis. These also showed up very strongly as a, as a key moment where transparency reforms are introduced and, uh, and take hold. Again, South Africa, Brazil, and South Korea are some of the key examples. Crisis of this sort, uh, South Africa and Brazil both grappled in the late 90s with um, 
uh, a, 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 a sort of uh, an evolving fiscal crisis because of subnational governments' profligacy. So they had to put the reins uh, on, on subnational spending, and in order to do that, they implemented very strong fiscal transparency rules that then became sort of part of the public financial management system and brought about an, a number of other uh, benefits that were not uh, necessarily due to uh, the fiscal discipline imperative. So these crises, this fiscal and economic crisis, open up important windows of opportunities for reformers, both within and outside government. Uh, and again, this, this issue of having reformers within government and having pressure coming from the outside seems to be one of the key factors that brings about not just increases in fiscal transparency, but some of the uh, additional benefits that come from participation and accountability. Uh, third element, third factor was uh, uh, corruption scandals. So we had a number of cases in which um, sort of highly public and uh, um, uh, where public opinion cried out very strongly against cases of, or very public cases of, of corruption. Brazil and Guatemala are two cases that, uh, that come to mind, where the power of, of, of these scandals and the, and the outcry that came from them actually mobilized the public opinion and created, again, windows of opportunity for, uh, for transparency-related reforms. Kenya is another important example of that. Uh, they've implemented a number of wide-ranging, not just transparency, but transparency plus participation reforms recently, partly as a response to the um, to the huge corruption scandals that um, uh, that the previous uh, uh, regime um, was guilty of, but we also see some some uh, influence of corruption scandals in in less likely cases. So Vietnam and China, for example, uh, where their level of transparency remains very low, but whatever little has been done in these countries to promote more open budgets is actually due to. Um, mounting popular concern over increasing corruption levels. And government responses to at least do something, and it's usually mostly just at the local level, so that it doesn't really make a big difference uh, uh, countrywide, but at least some local responses to make sure that the legitimacy of the government is, uh, is kept um, uh, in the face of, of, of this mounting popular concern over corruption. Uh, and the fourth and final factor uh, is, is linked to donor influences. Uh, and here you see uh, two things, really. You see, you see donor influence playing out in different ways. So in cases like South Africa, Mexico, South Korea, Brazil, and Vietnam, it, it was a positive role that international donors played in bringing best practice examples from abroad, uh, their international standard setting experience, some targeted technical assistance where countries felt that they needed it. Uh, so in, in, in sort of in non-aid dependent countries, external actors could actually play a more positive role. In low income aid dependent countries, as was also shown in, uh, in, the, um, in the quantitative, in the, well, in the comparative paper that I spoke about earlier, uh, donor intervention was much more contradictory. So in Tanzania, for example, we saw evidence that it may have undermined domestic accountability mechanisms. And in Senegal, we saw clear evidence that whatever transparency donors were pushing for, it was transparency to themselves, and it was not transparency to the wider public. So then we, we tried to plot all of that into, into, into a table. And we thought it was, it was quite interesting that big, big sort of uh, critical junctures like political transitions and fiscal and economic crises seem to stimulate a lot of change and seem to uh, push for reform in countries that ended up taking the largest jumps in terms of levels of fiscal transparency and in terms of um, getting to higher levels of participation and accountability as well. While corruption scandals and external influences, while you know, they happened in more places, but they didn't seem to have quite a systematic or such an, an equally systematic impact on uh, uh, neither on fiscal transparency nor on participation and accountability. They seem to be more short-lived and, and more contradictory. So they, they're more evident in countries that didn't do that well in terms of our categorization of, uh, of fiscal transparency. We, um, but clearly one of the most important things is that these factors did not work in isolation. They all worked in different combinations, configurations, and, and sequences. So the next thing we did was to 
try and uh, um, come up with some ideas of, of country ideal types, we call them. Uh, looking at the ways in which different groups of countries uh, ev developed over time or evolved over time uh, in terms of increasing the levels of fiscal transparency and participation. And how some of these groupings actually may be applied uh, uh, beyond the group of countries that we looked at. So we called Brazil and South Korea middle, uh, as part of, a, of an idea, a country ideal type of middle and high income reformers and innovators. These countries are, are clearly at the cutting edge of transparency and participation practices. They mean uh, some of the stuff that they do is, is way beyond what is often done in, in OECD countries as well. Um, and, and in these countries, the combination of democratization, active civil society, and, and, a, a, and a focus on dis fiscal discipline brought about not just transparency, but also tra participation and accountability. They're seen as pioneers and innovators, and they mirror in some ways the, the experience of some higher income countries like uh, Australia, Canada, or some of the Scandinavian countries, but also other middle income countries like Chile, the Philippines, and or, or maybe some countries in Eastern Europe. So there's a, there's a potential whole cluster of countries up there uh, where transparency has, Im has improved dramatically and where it has brought about some other advantages as well. The second group that we looked at, we call them hybrid uh, reformers, and they include countries uh, from our sample, South Africa, Mexico, Guatemala, and Kenya. And in these countries, the different factors have not quite sort of gelled together to generate a virtuous cycle similar to the ones in the first group of countries. And here there's actually quite a, quite a large number of countries that we can include beyond the ones that we've covered. Uh, other Latin American countries like Peru and Argentina, but also countries like Russia, India, Malaysia, Indonesia. So this is quite a, quite a large potential group of, of countries that, that, that you know, we feel that we need to focus our attention on, because clearly there, there's, a, there's, a big, uh, there's a big challenge. There's some electoral accountability, but there's you know, very entrenched elites and, and, and a weaker civil society sector compared to other countries. Third group is, the, is a group that we call the aid-dependent improvers, so countries that despite their aid dependency and despite some of the contradictions that come with it, did actually achieve decent level of fiscal transparency, though uh, less of the benefits that come from participation and accountability. There's a bunch of other African countries like Ghana, Mali, and Namibia that fall into that group, but also maybe some Central American ones like Honduras and Nicaragua. Political transitions have only been partials, but corruption scandals and donor pressure has at least created some movement and some reform dynamic that uh, even though it may not be um, uh, long-lived or it may not be sustained over time. Finally, the fourth group of countries that we looked at, we call them stalled authoritarians. Uh, they, in, they include the likes of Vietnam, Senegal, and China, but that's, that's clearly a very difficult group where other countries like Ethiopia, Yemen, Cambodia, Central Asian countries uh, might also uh, fall within. It represents a big challenge because of the lack of any strong incentives for actually introducing and sustaining transparency reforms. <coughs> so change in these countries might only be able in the medium to long term. The last thing that we did uh, after, after sort of, um, so this was more focused on explaining the differences in, in fiscal transparency and to some extent participation. We actually could find much less evidence of those things uh, having an impact on government accountability. And we basically tried to capture some of that in what we call the, the accountability funnel where actually the number of cases that you find of fiscal transparency improving is much larger than the number of cases where you see increased or improved instances of citizen engagement and participation, which in turn is again much larger than the few cases in which you see enhanced uh, accountability. Uh, and we don't really have a clear explanation for this except for the fact that it's increasingly stringent conditions that seem to allow countries to move, let's say, from the wider end of the funnel to the, to the, to the narrower end of the funnel. And, and, and those are sort of contextual factors that um, belong to the list of, of the ones that I've, that I've mentioned earlier, but basically make it increasingly difficult um, uh, for fiscal transparency to, to in turn be able to affect participation and then, and then accountability.
Uh, in the words of Jonathan Fox, truth often fails to lead to justice, which means that despite having high levels of, of, of transparency and in some cases participation as well, that does not necessarily mean that we'll be able to um, do much with it. Despite that sort of slightly uncomforting finding, we, we ended uh, the, the summary chapter, for those of you who will get around to reading it, with some ground for future hope. I mean, much of this research, as I said, was historical and basically covered the period up to 2008 or 2009 in some cases. Uh, what's happened since then, or what's been happening, let's say, in, the, in these later stages? <coughs> International norms and initiatives have proliferated, and I've only put you know, some of those up there. Open Government Partnership was launched a couple of years ago, the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency a little while later. EITI and IATI have been around uh, for a few years as well. IBP has been instrumental also in putting together a, a worldwide civil society campaign on making budgets public now, even that now was already a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure so far it has had a huge impact, but you know, we're working on it. So at least uh, what, what we see is, is a proliferation of international initiatives, international debate, discourse, and, and attention to this, uh, in this area, which hopefully will create a more conducive environment for reforms at the country level. Number two, donors as a part of that are increasingly emphasizing and promoting transparency more generally, but budget transparency more specifically as a key aspect of governance. The FID has included a, a, a budget transparency criteria in, uh, in its uh, guidelines for budget support. The European Commission has done something similar. The World Bank came out with a declaration a couple of years ago saying it wouldn't lend to any country that doesn't publish its budget. Even they then decided that um, they, they, they sort of defined that minimum threshold in very generous terms, so it didn't really make any difference to the actual operations. And there's more and more um, uh, donor agencies that are, that are looking into uh, doing something similar. And finally, and possibly most importantly, civil society and other accountability actors that we've seen and we work with have, over the past decade or so, have made a huge jump in terms of the, the, not only their interest in budget policies and budget processes, but also their capacity to engage with them uh, and, and, and their actual engagement with these processes. So they, they're doing more and they're trying more and they've gained more, uh, more skills and capacities and tools to uh, more effectively present their case to government and hopefully be able to um, influence government policies. So to, I will basically say, I'm not gonna go through these examples, but IBP is gathering additional evidence of cases where this has actually resulted in uh, changes in government policy and increases in budget transparency uh, or shifts in budget allocations and so on and so forth. So we're trying to contribute to the research in this area also by building up the evidence base, uh, which is still in need of further systematization, but at least it's, it's, it's starting to emerge. And to finish, um, I guess three points looking forward. First point is that at least I, I, I got away a little bit frustrated with some of the findings of the book. You know, they're, they're great from a research perspective. Um, the, you know, they provide some very interesting points in terms of what's happened over time, but they actually give you very limited policy relevant takeaways or, or very limited sort of uh, actionable things that you can take home and do something about or campaign for or, or, or advocate for. You know, you can't really go around telling civil society groups uh, cause a fiscal and economic crisis or you know, push for a political <laughs> transition or something like that. It doesn't really work like that. Uh, you know, or cause a corruption scandal. Uh, so unfortunately, it wasn't really, we, we couldn't come up with many uh, actionable points from, from the findings of our research. But uh, nevertheless, we thought that, th that there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting material in there uh, and, and two directions for further research. One is the need to further unpack and understand incentives for change mostly within governments. What is it that makes governments move? What is it that makes governments tick? Besides some of these non-influenceable factors that we've already uh, mentioned. And two, uh, further investigation on the linkages between transparency, participation, and accountability. So better trying to understand why the funnel is shaped like that, and what are some of the factors that may, be, that may help us uh, open up that funnel. 
uh, of course, all of this is still work in progress. Many of us are working in this area, and I, we all look forward to uh, working together with others in this work to be continued. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paolo, for a, a rich, informative, and, and very, very clear presentation. Extremely helpful. I'm going to ask you to sort of hold your questions because we're going to sort of try and provoke the discussion a little bit more. But I'm sure that there'll be a, a lot of interest, particularly in what you found around some of the drivers and conditions that support the emergence of transparency. There'll be something around the these sort of these posited ideal types of country classification and this this rather sort of complex group of hybrid reformer, reformers where we don't know what quite what to make of those and um, the accountability funnel, I'm sure people will want to come in and talk about that. Let me first turn to Rebecca and invite you to offer a few reflections and comments.